Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Uh, I pray uh, for our time together in the Word. Open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, uh, to see truth and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we have talked about uh, two issues that have been going on in the Philippian church. Issue number one is the internal conflict that they were having. We've, we've talked about that a lot the last two or three weeks because that's what Paul has been focusing on in the first part of chapter two. He's now going to turn it a little bit uh, and talk about the second problem they were having is, that is how to live out their faith in the middle of a pagan culture. And so being a Christian in the Roman Empire in first century times uh, was a pretty perilous proposition. Uh, one, there were no, not a whole lot of Christians in these cities, and uh, they stood out like sore thumbs. They were the ones that refused to bow down and worship Caesar. They were always, quote, causing trouble because they were, would not, um, they would not compromise their faith uh, by exalting uh, Caesar as Lord, and so it caused them lots of problems. And so one of the things Paul talked about in all of his epistles is how do you live out your faith and your culture? And so he's going to talk about that now in 2, 12 through 18. And there's a little bit of crossover between the first problem and the second problem, as you can imagine, because anytime a church is fighting and is not unified, it affects how they're living out their faith and culture because churches that fight and are disunified are churches that get a bad reputation in culture, right? So they, they overlap, they, they, they play together here, uh, and he's going to make a reference to that, and we'll see that in this text as well. So let's uh, begin. We're going to read uh, 12 and 13, and we'll cover those two verses, and then uh, after our discussion, then we'll go 14 through 18. He begins by saying this, Therefore, and let me just say this, and it's in your notes, therefore what? What's he just been talking about? In 2, uh, 1 through 11, he was talking about humility, right? In humility, consider others better than yourselves. We talked about that. Jesus was the great example of that. And he says, therefore, in light of what Jesus has done for you, he just quoted that hymn about Jesus humbling himself and dying on a cross for our sins. Therefore, in light of the fact that Jesus has saved you, you need to, and then he's going to tell us what. Okay, so he says, therefore, in light of what Jesus has done, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but not much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, there's, there's two hours worth of stuff right there, but, but we're going we're gonna to at least hit the high points of this, okay? I, I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, um, he's trying to be positive here. He's, he's really encouraging them here. My dear friends, he calls them dear friends. He loves these people, right? And, and he's, just, he's got on them pretty hard now at the first of chapter 2 about uh, their pride and their arrogance and not, and not submitting to one another, not humbling themselves. But he still calls them dear friends. He says, you know what, you've always obeyed me. You've always obeyed me. When I was among you and I would tell you to do something, you would do it. So now, not only have you obeyed me in my presence, but I'm going to ask you now even in my absence. I'm not going to be there with you. I'm still going to ask you to obey what I'm asking you to do. And then here's what he asked him to do. Work at your salvation with fear and trembling. Um, many versions say work out your salvation. If you'll notice in your notes under Roman numeral 2a, Put your salvation to work. That's kind of literally what that Greek phrase means. Put your salvation to work. Get your salvation and put it to work. It's not just an intellectual exercise of believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and forgave you of your sins. There's actually a part of it where you take that and apply it to your lives. Um, somewhere in these notes, I think I put it, it's easy to be saved, it's just harder to act saved, <laughs> right? I mean, it's easy to say, Jesus, you're my Savior. Come on and forgive my sins. Let's do that. It's a whole lot harder to say, Jesus, you're my Lord, and I'm going to die to myself and put your agenda in the front of my life. That's a lot harder to do. And so he uses this phrase here and says, put your salvation to work or work out your salvation. And so let me just give you a little bit of understanding about salvation. I'm going to give you a little mini sermon here. Uh, salvation literally means, in the original language, wholeness wholeness. 
And when we think about salvation uh, in America today, it's real simple in our minds. Well, it's the day I gave my life to Christ. I, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. That's the day I was saved, and now I'm saved. In the, the first century Middle Eastern mind would not have interpreted it that way. It's not a point-in-time action. Salvation is a process that begins certainly the day you give your life to Jesus Christ and ask Jesus in your heart, but it is a, it is a, it is a process, it's a lifelong process to wholeness that is completed when? When we see Jesus face to face, right? So let me give you a couple of examples. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, if, if uh, you can turn there with me. One of the great salvation scriptures in all of the New Testament. It says in verse 4, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in, in transgressions. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Okay, so that's past tense, right? So what's he saying? He's saying, listen, the day you gave your life to Christ, you were saved, past tense. That's, that's when this process to wholeness began. It began right there, and we know exactly when that is. That's the day you gave your life to Christ. But if you'll go over to 1 Peter chapter 1, and you've never read Ephesians chapter 1, listen to what he says here in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to back it all the way up to verse 3. He says, In His great mercy He has given us, see that, see that past tense? He has given us new birth. What's that? That's that salvation that at the very beginning, right? When I gave my life to Christ. Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are being shielded by power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So according to Peter in 1 Peter, when does salvation happen? Well, it happens when I see Jesus face to face. Well, you say, well, how can Peter say face to face, and how can Paul say it's the day you gave your life to Christ? The answer is yes, it's both. It's called the already not yet of the gospel. <laughs> the already not yet. And when it comes to salvation, I was saved so that I can work out my salvation so that I can be saved. I was saved, now I'm putting my salvation to work, and when I see Him face to face, He's going to go ahead and culminate that salvation with my trip to heaven. Okay, so, so when He's talking about work your salvation out, He's not talking about a works righteousness system, where, okay, God's going to do 50% of the work, and then you're going to do the rest. No, God does how much of the work? A hundred percent of the work. I simply receive this salvation, and I, I, I receive it the day I give my life to Christ, but it's fully, uh, it's fully realized the day I go to heaven, and what's this part in the middle? Well, it's just my living out my salvation. It's putting my salvation to work day by day by day by day. It doesn't mean I have to do something to earn it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be more saved if I'm a little more holy than I was yesterday. No, that, that, that has nothing to do with it. It's about the practical application of walk out your salvation. Every single day, you're saved. Now go live like it. Walk it out. Act like it. Don't just say Jesus is Lord. Make Him Lord. Let's do this salvation thing right. Let's walk in obedience. Let's make Jesus Lord, not just Savior. It's a whole lot easier to be saved than to act saved. Act like you are. That, Paul does that over and over and over again in Scripture. He tells us who we are in Christ. He says, Leonard, you're saved. Now go act like it. That's what he's saying here. Does that make sense? The reason I'm, I'm spending a little time here talking about it is because there are certain churches, certain people that will read that to say, See, God doesn't do all the work. We still have to do some of the work in salvation. It's not true. You're saved, now go act like it. It's like me having a child, and I'm raising a child, and say, look, you're a small. That's who you are. That's your identity. Now go act like it. In other words, don't embarrass me. 
<laughs> right? Don't embarrass me. That's kind of what Paul is saying here. Okay? And he says salvation with what? You go put it to work with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. That's another very interesting phrase there. We know from the Old Testament, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we hear about fearing God, fearing God, fearing God. It's not fearing God like, buddy, if you don't straighten up, God is going to strike you down and send you to hell, and He's going to laugh every, day, every step of the way. That's not fearing God. It's the fear that is the awe and respect of a child for a father, right? When I was growing up, I respected my dad. I loved my dad, but I feared my dad. You know why I feared my dad? Because he had a belt. And when I got out of line, he used it. And when he used it, I didn't enjoy it, okay? Didn't, didn't mean I was scared of him. He was never going to kill me. He, I was never physically abused, none of that. But there was this respect and awe and fear and love that all came together in the protective love of a father. And that's what he's talking about here. He's saying, listen, why are you putting your salvation to work? Why are you living out your salvation? Why, why, why would you act like you're saved when you're saved? Well, the reason is, is because of dad. Because of dad. You want to make dad proud. You don't want to get dad mad. You don't want to have to go behind the shed and get a whipping. Those of you who are over 40, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You younger guys, you just got a time out. <laughs> right? So that's that, that's that awe and respect that we're talking about. Okay, so that's the fear and trembling. In other words, here's what he's saying. Guys, what I'm saying to you is really, really important. It's really, really important. And I want you to think about your dad and how you feel about your dad. You know dad's going to protect you. You're a part of the family. Now, go make dad proud and don't make dad discipline you because dad will do that. Correct? Will God discipline us when we get out of line? Of course. Do we like it? Of course not. Does he like it? No, he doesn't want to have to discipline us, but why does he do it? Because he loves us, he cares about us, and he wants to get us back in line working out that salvation, right? So he's saying, put that to work with fear and trembling. And then comes this great last phrase, for it is God who works in you. Don't miss this. What's he saying? He's saying, I know it sounds hard to put your salvation to work and to act like you're saved, but here's the amazing thing. God never asks you to do anything he won't empower you to do. You need to remember that because Satan wants you to believe that it's too hard, that you can't do it. You can't walk in obedience. It's just too hard. The standard's too high. The bar's set too high. I can't do this. God says, listen, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. The day you're saved, that's the gift you receive, right? You have the Holy Spirit living in you. He will always empower you to do the right thing. He will always empower you to make the right decision. So when I make the wrong decision, I can't blame God or say, well, he just set the standard too high. No, he put the power in me to do his will, correct? So the problem is not the Holy Spirit or God set the standard too high. The problem is I ignored the voice of the Holy Spirit living in me and went my own way, correct? So I've got to take, I've got to take ownership of that. He says, listen, God is in you and works in you. He works in you. He has the power to work in you. He's working in you for obedience. He's working in you to walk out your salvation. He's working in you to live what God has asked you to live. This is not impossible. In fact, it's more than possible because God's in you. The power is in you to do this. And then he makes this final phrase here, to will and to act according to his good purpose. Because everything God is doing is for what? Your good. It's your good. It's His purposes in you. Now, once again, I want to go back to this father-child analogy. You guys who have kids, you understand this. You always do what's best for your kids, right? I mean, a good father does. He always does what's best for his kids. Sometimes that's giving them exactly what they want. That's having some wonderful times with them. 
Sometimes, not often, but sometimes it means disciplining them. Sometimes it's even pretty harshly. But everything you're doing as a father is for what? The good of your child. And you're an imperfect father. Think about the perfect father now. He says, I'm always working in you for what? The purposes in, in you that I need to work out because I know what's best for you. Keith, I know what's best for you. I'm wiser than you. I'm smarter than you. I created you. And, and I want to give you what you ask for when you ask. But when you ask for things that aren't best for you, I'm always going to tell you no. Why? Because I always have your best interest at heart. It's always my purposes for your good. My purposes for your good. So God says, listen, my purposes are always for your good. So why are you fighting me? Why are you fighting me? Why are you shaking your fist at me and saying, I'm not going to do that, God? He said, all I'm going to do, is it's just going to be more painful for you because I've got your good purposes here. So why don't you do something like surrender and say, you know what, God, I trust you that your purposes are good for me. I trust you that you know what's better for me than I know for myself. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the role in salvation you've asked me to take. I'm going to allow you to work through me. And I'm just going to follow you and obey you and die to myself and surrender. All the things we talked about the last two weeks in 2, 1 through 11, right? I'm going to do that. Why? Because I trust him. Because I know that I know that I know that God has my best interest at heart. His purposes are good for me. He knows better what's good for me than I do. And sometimes when he takes things away from me that I love, it's because he knows those things will hurt me. And so I know it sounds like I'm speaking through both sides of my mouth, but the most important thing you do in working out your salvation <laughs> is taking a passive role and letting God work in you, <laughs> right? And that's hard to do for us type A personality men, correct? But God says, that's what I need you to do because you have to believe that I have your best interest at heart. Okay, so we're going to stop right here. That's the first couple of verses. You know I could have preached about that for another hour, right? There's a lot of stuff in there. But we're going to go around the tables. We're going to talk for a few minutes. We've got some questions going to come up on the screen for those of you watching by video. And then uh, we'll come back and deal with the second half of this passage this morning. Beginning in verse 14, he says, do everything without complaining or arguing. So, so now he's going to kind of lay out part of the problem with the Philippians is because they're in conflict with one another and they're complaining and arguing and backbiting and all that, it's having an influence on what? What's going on out in culture because they're getting a bad reputation. And you guys have seen that happen over and over again in churches, right? When, when Christians don't get along... Non-Christians don't want to be a part of it, correct? And so that's what's happening here. So he says, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. So he's, he's making this distinction between this crooked and depraved generation. And by the way, that probably is a quotation from Deuteronomy 32.5 where God describes the pagan nations that were around the Israelites. He called them a crooked and depraved generation. Paul kind of borrows that, that verbiage and says, you know what, life hasn't changed much. Still a crooked and depraved generation. And here we are 2,000 years later where supposedly we're much more enlightened and advanced. Are we still a crooked and depraved generation? Absolutely. And how the Bible describes it as darkness it's darkness. Remember John chapter 1? Jesus is the light and he came into the darkness, but the darkness would not accept it, right? And so the gospel is like light and darkness. And so he uses this beautiful word picture here. He says, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And so this word picture he gives for us as Christians is, 
We're living in a culture that's crooked and depraved. It's dark. It's like a night sky. And you know what we're like? We're like stars that are twinkling, shining brightly in that night sky. That's who we are. That's how we function when we're fully functional, healthy believers and Christians that are walking out our salvation. Why do we need to walk out our salvation? So we have a witness. So we look like a bright star in the middle of the night sky. One thing I hate about living in a big city is you can't see the stars at night. But man, if you'll go up around Flagstaff, you go out in the country at night, you look up, and I mean, it's just, just covered, right? Now, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have that problem. They got to see that night sky every night. And Paul says, let me just give you a real simple word picture here. Go outside tonight, look up in the sky, and see all those stars shining up against that dark sky. That dark sky is the world, and that shining star, that's you. You're a shining star. And the reason I want you walking out your salvation and, and to get along as a church and not to argue and complain and backbite and gossip and all that garbage, the reason I want you to get out of, out of your life is I want you to shine brightly because you are pure and blameless. And by the way, that blameless doesn't mean perfect. doesn't mean perfect. It means what? Sold out is basically what it means. It means that you're given over to God, that you are walking out that salvation. He calls it blameless without fault. Doesn't mean perfect. Doesn't mean perfect. It just means Jesus is the Lord of your life and you're living out your faith, right? And what happens is, if we are not living out our faith, what happens to those lights? They get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. I, I, early on in my ministry, I had this conversation with this guy. I know I've talked about this before. That was so riveting to me that helped me understand this concept more than anything else. He was, a, he was an Air Force pilot, um, 25 years old, great looking, athletic. He, he's one of those guys you, you just look, you just kind of get jealous because he's so smart, so talented, athletically good looking. I'm like, you know, what? you gave him all that, Lord, look at this. What happened, you know? And, and he, but he was a pagan. He was, he was living in darkness. And I'm witnessing to him. And he was interested um, intellectually. But here was his hang-up. He says, you know what? I go to the bar every Friday night and I pick up a girl and I sleep with her every Friday night. Sometimes I pick up non-Christian girls. Sometimes I pick up Christian girls. You know the difference between a non-Christian and a Christian girl? The next day the Christian girl feels guilty. Now, why do I want to be a part of that? What happened? Well, they weren't walking out their salvation with fear and trembling, right? When you live like the world, when your ethics are the same of the world, when your moral values are the same of the world, when you're acting like the world, your light goes out. I'm not saying you lose your salvation. I'm not saying if you die, you're not going to heaven. I'm saying your witness is flawed. You have no witness. Why would, I, why would I want to give my life to Christ and be a part of a church if all you guys are going to do is get together and argue and complain and backbite and gossip about one another? Why would I do that? Why would I want to be a part of a church where you guys act no different from the world, you just pretend to? And then you judge us. Those are the things I hear from non-Christians all the time. Now, some of that is their flawed thinking, but there's a little bit of truth to that, isn't there? You know, I've always said that in, in the United States of America, I wish that Christian businessmen were so ethical that if you were a Christian, you didn't have to have a legal contract. Because my dad was raised in the oil field. I remember in the 70s, he had contracts with Exxon, Mobil, Texaco, based on a handshake. Multi-million dollar contracts. And they just shook hands and did what they said they were going to do. Can't do that anymore. And in fact, and I've told you guys this before too, the most, the most common conversation I have with men that I talk to every day, sex. You know what number two is? The pain associated with doing business with other Christian businessmen who use their Christianity to take advantage. Where's the light shining? Why do I like Equity Auto? Because those two guys 
They're ethical men. They're not going to steal from people. They're not going to have their, their salespeople mislead people about price or about the condition of the car just to make a sale. They wouldn't do that because I know who they are. And you don't think their light shines brightly? And that's why even in a downturn economy when so many small companies, automobile companies are going out of business, they stayed in business because the Lord had their back. Is that true? Absolutely is true. Guys, we've got to shine like stars. It's a dark, black, ugly sky out there. And he says, in the, black, in the middle of that, I need some, sh some stars shining brightly. How do you do that? Not perfection, but just walk out your salvation. Just, just live this. Just take it serious. Just take this thing serious. Don't make Christianity something you do on Sundays and say, yeah, I believe, and then go live like the world. You're not accomplishing what God's designed you to accomplish. Right? Take it seriously. Live it out. Your salvation is something that you're wearing every day, 24-7. Then he continues on. And, and he says, you shine like stars. Why? Because you're holding out the word of life. There's, there's another word picture here. Every time he uses life, he's talking about what's the world? Death. And what's Jesus? He brings life into a dead world. He brings light into a dark world. And so he, he kind of mixes his metaphors here. He said, be, be like bright lights in a dark, against a dark sky. Why? Because you have the word of life that's going to bring life to dead people. And when dead people come to life, then they become like a bright shining star. And then Paul uh, does, we would probably consider this manipulation in today's world. <laughs> But Paul kind of strong arms him here at the end. Here's what he says. Why do I want you to do that? In order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. In other words, he says, look, I have this long history of ministry. Please don't make me stand before the Lord on judgment day with a failed Philippian church on my resume. Would you, would you just not let that happen? Would you go ahead and get this thing fixed so on the day of Christ I can check off Philippian church as one of those great moves of God? And then he says this, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. In other words, he says, Remember Paul says that we're living sacrifices? So he goes back to the Old Testament sacrificial system here, and, and really pagan sacrificial system too, where they would take animals and sacrifice them and lay them on the altar and kill them. He said, look, I am laying my life out like a drink offering, like a sacrifice. If I'm doing that, the least you could do is get along with each other, right? Right? I mean, if I'm willing to die for my faith, aren't, aren't you willing to get along with the other Christians and take your faith seriously? It's easy to be saved. It's just hard to act saved. Right? Work out your salvation. Make me proud, Paul said. And he says, when you do, in the end of days, we're going to all be up there together, and you're going to be glad you did. Right? Right? So that's the calling. Why do we work out our salvation? So we can shine like stars. So I've got some great questions here at the end. Uh, I want you to talk about here for a few minutes and then we'll wrap up uh, with, a, with a prayer at the end. But there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, and so go around the tables, talk about the questions. They'll come up on the screen uh, and, and then we'll pray, pray it out here in just a few minutes.